morning, everyone. My name is Michael Hill Gonzalez, and with me is my partner, Frederick. And we'll be talking about NetSmart by the author, Howard Rangel. Now, the book is about learning how to use the internet in a way that's intelligent. Hence the title. The point is that a lot of people know about the internet, but they're not exactly sure on what, where to start with. Do they begin searching on the web? Do they start socializing with their friends in media like Twitter or Facebook? But, and that will be the main topic of it, this book. It's divided into different categories that will teach us how to get into the internet when you don't know what you're doing. And it's many tools. The author believes in knowing how to use it intelligently because a lot of people don't know where to start. And he provides different methods for us to teach us how to use the web intelligently. It could be some exercises, uh, just putting a list of goals. It all varies between what you're doing. And it is the different topics, it divided into six. And the methodology he used was from his own experiences. And to support these claims, he got articles from different professors throughout uh, the entire world, really, mostly from the States or Japan, to check what the different groups of people are doing online. And to start things off, we go in the first chapter. It's about your attention habits. When you start getting into the internet, you gotta remember, you gotta control these habits of yours to know what you wanna do, specific goal in mind, when you start using the internet. And that's the first part, is learning to control these habits. Because when you get used to it, this can lead to some bad habits when you don't know how to control your attention. Take for example, let's say you just started getting used to, say, uh, Facebook. You just made a new account, you're used to it, you're talking with all your friends, you got all these new contacts. You're always getting alerts because you're on your phone. Now, this can lead to you losing your attention in your daily activities. Say you got a family, you start paying attention more to your phone than you do to your kids. Or, in a worst case scenario, you get into a car, the activities go up and you just gotta keep texting and texting, you can't stop, and you could get into an accident. And the point is to learn to control your activities, your attention, the different activities you do, by getting some executive control. What executive control is, is just filtering out the unnecessary information that could occur from, you know, all this new stream of information you got. So, once you learn to control that, there are many simple ways to do this. To start things off, you say you have a list of things you want to accomplish when you first get on. The point is to do at least 25 minutes to this goal. And you take a five minute break to do whatever you want. You can go look up videos, you could, uh, you know, know, listen to music, anything of your choice. And the point is you keep doing this and doing this so you don't get distracted. And your mind knows what it wants to do when it gets on. You don't get cluttered by a lot of tabs in the computer so you actually finish what you started instead of completely diverting yourself into the web. Then once you start getting control of your attention, you have executive control, then we go into, and it's how it's titled in the book, Crap Detection. Now, the point is that due to the internet being so much bigger now, it gets with a lot of ads, spam, non-credible sources, lots of information is fake. A lot of it. And Howard points out many of the issues of using this information, and especially academic-wise. Because when you're trying to find information online, you also have to do, put references. And it's not even that enough. The information could be wrong in its own. Uh, he used an example of his daughter who wanted to ask, how do I know if it's right? Who can tell me that? And the problem is that you have to judge that from the offer on your own. You have to check if it's a credible source, if they're not, you know, just giving bad information. And that's the problem with the web. There's a lot of sources that can lead, you know, those ads that say earn $800 a day by working with Google. You obviously aren't going to do that. It's not going to happen. And once you get to that information, you have to make sure these sources are credible. So what you do is, like, you go on certain websites that are titled uh, easywhois.com. And what you do is you type in the author's name, and it pops up if they're a credible source. Once you do that, well, there you go, you can use the information. Now, the reason you do this is very simple. You don't want to get 
uh, freaking uh, cause of plagiarism. You don't want to have any of that happen. So you just take an extra, an extra two minutes of your time, you put it in, and you're done. And also he talks about using the search function properly. There's a advanced searching, which you do to minimize these bad, these, uh, bad results you get on the internet. Now, you don't want to use too many words or too little. You want to put yourself in the mind of the author of what you want to find. Say you're looking for an article on Martin Luther King. You imagine what would they talk about Martin Luther King? What influence was the speeches he made? How he affected his pe the people? And you just do that. You put yourself in the shoes of the author. And once you do that, you got to try organizing all your bookmarks. We have seen in classes we got something along the lines of NetBuys, where you get your own dashboard. You can organize all your bookmarks. It becomes a lot easier to find the information you want. And it makes the process a lot more, it's a lot smoother. It's a much better experience. And once you start getting, you know, you find the proper information, you start getting your attention right, you get to chapter three, which is about participation. This is more something we all, we're all very familiar with. It's about immersing yourself online, getting into social media, digital media, sharing what you, sharing what you like to your friends and family. And the thing is, there is also good and bad participation. For example, let's say someone's trying to make YouTube videos or make blogs or post in forums. They're not always going to be very uh, creative or intuitive. It could be very bad posts, uninspiring videos. It's just a waste of time. Now, the point is to immerse yourself online in a very productive way. Because there are many websites like LinkedIn or your own blogs, which you can do to share. Say you're, say you're bad. Say you're starting out, you're a DJ, anything, you're making music. You want to share it to everyone in the world. You make a blog and people start sharing it. They like your content. You're going to get hits. You're going to get a lot of people looking at your, looking at your music. You're going to get noticed. You'll get to concerts. And in LinkedIn, it helps you put your resumes. It helps you have all your information, what you've done. And it's easy to refer to the people because it's a social, it's a business social website where you can get all the information, all the information out. And along with this, Howard mentions there are two types of participation groups. They're known as friendship and interests. Friendship is more mainstream as what we know. We have Twitter, we got Facebook, and uh, blogs, stuff like that. And there's also another one which is the interest-driven group. This one's more of a minority. It's about topics that people aren't usually familiar with, like let's say underground hip-hop or something along the lines of that. It's what you can imagine is not very mainstream at the moment. And these are different in a way that they're more, how should I say, they're more serious about their stuff. They more talk about immersing itself in their subcultures and really it's more of a minority. You won't see that more often. And besides that, he puts an emphasis on blogging, which I've mentioned before, it's about getting yourself an OS, communicating more people, and using it to your advantages to get connections. And finally, the last method of participation is known as curation. It's curation. It's, it's basically what I mentioned before about bookmarking, but now you're sharing your bookmarks. You're also tagging stuff, you're liking, you're getting people noticed. And it's a type of participation where you can help out people you like. And Really, that's most of participation. It's just about immersing yourself, what the class also taught us using blogs, and really just getting noticed, enjoying all the new tools that you have available, and sharing along with everyone there. Now, I'm going to leave you all to my friend Frederick, and he's going to go cover the next three chapters. The next one is collaboration. Um, uh, un segundo, Frederick. Eh, miren a todo el mundo, ok, no solamente a mí, cuando, cuando explican, pero muy bien. Okay. Eh, en chapter 4, we most of it talked about the, the experience of massive collaboration of users, which can improve the internet. We all know that one person cannot do everything, everything but more, more people can do more than one person. Exactly. It introduces collect collective intelligence, which is, which is what I'm trying to explain, which involves three things, I mean four things. Okay. Networking, 
co coordination, cooperation, and collaboration. Networking is as simple as giving out business cards okay. and knowing, um, letting you know to the, the community. Coordination is having the steps, um, say, expressed of what you're going to do and what you're going to give to people. Cooperation is when more than one people has has the same theme or goals to achieve. Uh, and they help each other. Yeah, and collaborate. Collaboration is exactly the same. Oh, okay. Collaborating. Um. So it's like Wikipedia or something. Yeah, okay. Wikipedia could be that when you add, let's say, you talk about Martin Luther King. Okay. And you add one information about him, and another person adds another information, and so on, so on, and it. It creates a more brief or better, it's a better explanation than, than one person. Mm -hmm. um, it teaches that even the small information like sharing a post, blogging, retweeting, or posting some information is known as collective inf uh, intelligence because it helps the community know more than what they already know. Okay. Um, in chapter, si um, chapter 5, it talks about online networking and the part particular to society uh, sites. Yeah. Uh, they say that in one study in the University of California, researchers tracked the dynamic spread of happiness throughout social media. Let's say posting positive things on Facebook, mm -hmm. other people read it and they feel happy as well. And that helped um, expand the positive things that people have. Uh, not only does the social media allow its users to maintain relationship with others that we might otherwise not stay in contact with, but researchers discover that sharing positive information online and being supportive to one another makes the sharers happy. So it gives you motivation to share. Um, as you say, the importance of, of how sharing information online can strengthen ties, let's say that your friends, your friends want wants to know something, mm -hmm. but they know they don't know as much as you do, and you help them by let's say sharing a a link about something they want to know. Let's say we don't know a lot about one topic, and a friend of yours helps you by giving you a. Uh, and like say you're doing a project, you could share a news article related to something. Exactly. Exactly. Um, let's say that in this case. We, we shared each other's, we helped each other by giving pieces of information about the book and etc. In chapter 6, the, it explains how to use network in a mindful way. Let's say not just searching for information or just blogging about things. Yeah. Exactly. It, helped, uh, it introduces the skills necessary to succeed online involving topics such as privacy, the public sphere, remix culture, and what parents should know about the children's social media use. Mm. In privacy, we all know that nowadays, we don't know what happens beyond what you do on Facebook, what you post on Facebook, etc. And we don't know what other people do or which, what type of people go into your profile or your Twitter or see your photos, etc. Et In the public sphere, it, it involves politics and how politi politi um, politicians manipulate the social media for their to, advantage yeah. yeah for their advantage and what they want to show instead of what they need to show in real social is exactly when let's say you do a work of let's say you do your own music like you were oh, saying okay. and somebody remixes the song and they benefit of, about that and that's when the the idea of copyright was it was invented. Was invented. So they can't profit from your because work. of that. Because people used to profit from your work, and you don't profit from your own work, which mm -hmm. was the first thing you did. Exactly. And that slightly evolved when when in, uh, iTunes involved the purchasing of movies and videos mm -hmm. and okay. music. Um, and last is that the, what parents should know about their children's use of social media in a positive way. Most of, most nowadays, people, I mean, the, the parents 
get stressed when they see their children constantly on Facebook, on the they don't know what Twitter, doing. and they, they go nuts. And the the uh, the author explains how parents should manage this without driving their kids nuts. Exactly. And it basically shows that to pers to participate with them in in what they're doing, mm -hmm. paying attention of what what their needs, and since and this comes in because of the fact that let's say nowadays there's no park, not not so much parks where teenagers can reunite and they talk and out. say things. So they they prefer media and. Facebook chats, Twitter messages, etc., etc., and that way they communicate with their friends and stay in contact, etc. Exactly. Some and you can communicate with some friends that you know aren't even in the island. Exactly. They could be out in the states. And the point is just letting the parents know that it's nothing bad. Exactly. Basically, that's one of the things. And paying attention to what they do, but not over over attend what they do. Yeah. And uh, not, not taking away what they do on the network, but telling them that the positive things and negative things that are in the network, and how they can avoid, avoid those. Exactly. And I think that just about covers chapter six, right? Yeah. And now. Our thoughts on the book, the conclusion, what we thought. The author makes some good points. A lot of people don't know how to use the internet. It's a great tool. Everyone has access to vast amounts of information from your pocket or from the comfort of your home. You can sit down and get anything you want. Put some good points. You have to learn to properly have your attention because you can get overwhelmed by all that you can do. And of course, Knowing what you're doing, knowing that what your kids are doing, having to actually involve yourself, immerse yourself online is all good. And I say yeah, those are some good messages. However, the book in its own, the methods used, I didn't really enjoy it much. It was, it usually diverted off topic most of the times and really it was hard to get the message across in the book. He, with all the amount of pages of information he was trying to convey, it was just, it was out of nowhere. It didn't really have a coherent flow of, a flow of knowledge, man. It was just out of nowhere. And I don't know about you, but I got bored after the first page. I don't know. I, what do you well, think, man? Basically, I, I enjoy reading part of it, but as you say, you can resume all of that, all of what he gave, in less pages. Literally 20 pages to get to it. <laughs> It, he talks about, let's say in chapter 3, he mm -hmm. talked about attention exactly. and participation, participation etc. Yeah. In chapter 5, he, he says it again, but in another way. <laughs> and you're like, I already read this in chapter 3, why am I going to read exactly. it again in chapter you're 3 and 5? And, and it, it does say the same thing in other words. In the, let's say in chapter 1 it said one thing, and in chapter 6 it said the same thing, but in other words. And adding other examples. It's like it was trying to be the quote that. <laughs> but... And, other than that, I like the idea of the book. It's always good to use all the different functions that you have online. I just feel that it wasn't expressed well enough. You know, it could have been shorter. You could find most of this online. But either way, I enjoyed some of it. So I'd recommend it for at least chapter three. I like the participation one. That and one was good. Most of the people that might want to read this book are people that don't know a lot of uh, internet yeah, and like how it works, etc. Mm -hmm. But for us that know what the internet is and how it is. And I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even recommend it to the people that don't know about the internet because I recommend that people know just a little bit and just want a little bit more because they will just get lost with all the topics exactly. you mentioned. But either way, good book if you know just at least a tiny bit about the internet at the moment. And there's a reference, the book was made in 2012, How to Drive Online, and that just about covers our presentation. Thank you for your time. Any eh, questions? De cero a diez, que cuanto, the book? Four. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I think it's about how people are dedicated to what they know a little, not too much, and 
y quieren o sea, que saber más, problem. pero es demasiado verboso y se pierde entre, entre las cosas. Y yo estoy bastante de acuerdo con ustedes. Quizás yo lo leí con otros ojos, pero <coughs> es un poco verboso. Sí, pero... It's a good message. It's nice. Sí. sí. Yeah. Y el punto es, si ustedes no hubieran eh, sido estudiantes de esta clase y no hubieran tomado mm -hmm. clases, obviamente, de tecnología web y de otra cosa, <coughs> En ese tipo de zapato de estudiante, ¿qué hubieran pensado del libro? ¿Hubiera sido más útil? Sí, no menos repetitivo. Sea, por, por el simple hecho de que, exacto, explica la forma, o sea, la forma inteligente de ver el internet. Exacto. A, a, a no simplemente entrar a internet y usar... Exacto, exacto. pero a la garete, no share anything. ¿Descubrieron exacto. alguna herramienta que no conocían antes? Eh, de verdad que mucho lo que yo vi en el libro, like... I already learned about, say, NetVibes online. What I didn't know, though, was the website to find out the offer, the credibility, which is easywhois.com, and that is really helpful. Okay. Like, sometimes I don't know if I'm sure if I'm what I'm referencing is correct, so this takes the stress off my mind. Brilliant. So I can give it that. It gave me some good websites. All right. Eh, en la mini mini reseña que van a hacer online en el blog, no sé si la publicaron ya. Pongan esas eso. Los stops? Okay, sure. Okay. I got a lot to post on the blog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 